It is a joy to be with you. Um, Terry and I have been coming here to this island for over 25 years because we have been longtime friends with Al's uh, parents. We miss Norma. So good to see you, Veryl. In fact, when we were flying in here, there was a lady sitting on the other side of me. I was in the middle seat, and Terry was on the left of me. She's here on the front row, and this other lady. And we hit a few bumps in the air, and she, I heard her saying, Jesus, Jesus, like she was praying to Jesus under her breath. And, uh, and so by the end of the trip, I said, are you, are you coming home? Are you coming home to St. Vincent? She goes, yes. She goes, is this your first time? Oh, no, no. We've been here for 25 and she says, well, then you can't. <laughs> and so it's friends and family. So what better time to uh, feel more like I'm a Vinci than being uh, here on friends and family. It is so good to be with you. Love Pastor Al and Debbie and children, Matthew and Sherry, and just the wonderful work that God is doing here at High Point. Um, it is just wonderful to be a part of what you are doing Always good to find out what God is up to and get in on that. And so that's how I feel. We're coming to be a part of what God is doing here. And, and I have to admit, you know, if, if we were being asked to go speak at a spiritual enrichment week in Alaska, I may not have been as eager. But when Al said, come back to St. Vincent, I'm like, okay, that, we don't need to pray about that much, do we, honey? <laughs> this is a wonderful place. And especially because where I pastor is right outside of Washington, D.C., So it's good to get out of Washington, D.C., let me just tell you. It is wonderful to be here. Well, if you have your Bibles, if you'd open them to John's Gospel, chapter 6, that's where we are going to be. And in John's Gospel, Jesus makes seven I am statements to help us understand who he is and how he relates to you and me. And so I brought a slide with all seven, so we're going to throw all seven of these up on the screen so that you can see them with me. And why don't you just uh, help me along here and read all seven of these I am statements. Would you read them out loud with me? I am the bread of life. Number two, I am the light of the world. Number three, I am the door of the sheep. Number four, I am good shepherd. Number five, I am the resurrection and the life. Number six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And number seven, I am the true vine. So in the course of this morning, and then over the course of the evening services tonight and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we're going to actually look at all seven. Now, I know seven is more than the times we meet, but it's okay. I'm going to combine two on one of the nights. So you're going to have to come back tonight and during the week to hear the rest of the I am statements. But for this morning, we're going to look just at the first one where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So there you have it. This is the theme for this morning, I am the bread of life. This comes straight out of John's gospel, chapter 6 and verse 35. We're going to put that verse on the screen for you. And let's just read this all aloud and together. And Jesus said to them, I am bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Now, I'm going to read all of the context of this passage from John chapter 6. If you have your Bibles there, I'm going to read verses 22 to 40 so that we can see the context of this story where Jesus says this. And again, when Jesus uses these I am statements, he is saying something about himself And he is communicating who he is as he relates to you and me. So these are wonderful statements. Only John's gospel carries these seven I am statements. It's very unique to the gospel of John. And this is the first one here in chapter 6. So follow along as I read. I'm going to read starting at verse 22 down through verse 40. Uh, I'm reading from uh, New King James uh, Version. But here we go. John 6 verse 22. On the following day when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. 
Verse 24, when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they all got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his his seal on him. And then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. To me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will. But the will of him who sent lasting life at the last day. So that is the context here. There's actually a backstory we're going to get into, but again, it's verse 35 where he says, I am the bread. Of life. Let's have a word. House. It is good to open your word. It is good to settle our hearts before you. Whatever kind of a week we've had, the good of it and the bad, we lay it at your feet right now. And we come open hearted, open minded, that you would speak to us, Lord, afresh. And I pray for those in particular who may not know you in a personal way. Pray that you would reveal yourself in a personal and mighty and a loving way. And we thank you, Jesus, for loving us so much. You would give your life for us on a cross. Bless this time as we gather here in your name, your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' matchless name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. So let me just say at the beginning of this study, I am very thankful that Jesus did not say, I am the or I am the salad of life. He said here, listen, this is biblical. He said, I am the bread of life. Does anybody like bread? Let me see your hands. I love bread. I have to admit, I'm much of a bread addict and I love it in all of its forms. Uh, Muffins, biscuits, a loaf of bread, any kind of bread. And we have this thing in the United States. I don't know if it's here in St. Vincent's, but we glazed bread called Krispy Kreme donuts. Do you have Krispy Kreme donuts here? You have not lived, friends, until you have Krispy Kreme donuts. When the Bible talks about manna for <laughs> that's what it is. Oh, you got to come to the United States just to have Krispy Kreme donuts. I love bread, and I'm going to admit it right up front. There's, a, uh, there's a, a guy in um, American history, his name is Will Rogers, and he had this. I met a man I didn't like. never met bread I didn't like, <laughs> because I like all forms of bread. And nothing beats the smell like fresh bread. place where Terry, you're hungry now, aren't you? <laughs> the place where Terry and I are staying, they come out with seven choices of bread. It's like you want raisin bread, coconut bread, wheat bread, sourdough bread. It's like all these, I said, my answer is yes. 
My answer is yes. I love uh, yeah, cinnamon, banana. It's just amazing. I love bread. Jesus even said, listen, friends, Matthew 4, 4. He says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, what Jesus elevated is the word of God and bread. All right? So bread is a good thing. There's actually a lot of references when you think about it. There's a lot of references in bread. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Bethlehem in Hebrew is Bet Lechem. It means the house of bread. Lechem is bread. He was born in Bet Lechem, the house of bread, because Bethlehem was known as the place that grew a lot of wheat, harvested that wheat, and made bread. So Bethlehem was known as the house of bread. It's interesting, isn't it? Jesus said, I'm the bread. Even in the Lord's prayer, give us this day our daily bread. The communion elements, the bread, the wine. In the Old Testament, there was a table of showbread. There was a table before the tabernacle of the Lord with 12 loaves of bread on it, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. So bread was considered a main staple in their diet and still How is it then that Jesus is the bread of life, and why would he use that metaphor? Now, this story needs a little bit of a, of a context, even beyond what I read at the opening of our study. And so I'm going to refer to what we didn't read in chapter 6, but we're not going to read through all of it. I'm just going to summarize the earlier part of chapter 6. The point here is that when Jesus ends up saying to the people who were looking for him, I am the bread of life, they had been on the hunt for him. Why were they on the hunt for him? Why were they looking for Jesus? They couldn't find him. When they finally see him, they ask where he has been. And so the context is that in the beginning of chapter 6, it's the feeding of the 5,000. It is the... Um, only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000. And those of you who, who know your Bibles know that it is likely that it was really the miracle of the feeding of 15,000 or more, because in those days they only counted the men in these kind of events. And so when you multiply, might have been there, this is easily the miracle of 15,000, even though it's called the miracle of 5,000, because only the men were numbered. And so... Jesus had just got through performing this wonderful miracle at the beginning of chapter 6 of feeding the multitudes of thousands of people. And it tells us in, in the story in John 6, again, I'm just summarizing some of these events so we can get an appreciation for this encounter that they have with Jesus and why he says, I'm the bread of life. Uh, when, when Jesus sees the multitude, his heart goes out to them because he sees them as helpless and he wants to feed them. And so he calls Philip. He turns to Philip, one of his disciples. And he says, Philip, he says, uh, where are we going to buy bread for all of these people? Again, it's bread, he asks. Where are we going to buy bread for all these people? Because it was a main staple of their diet. Now, he knew where the bread was going to come from, but he was giving Philip an opportunity. He was giving Philip an opportunity to say, well, Lord, I don't know, but you know, you're the Lord, so you can do whatever you need to do. Instead, Philip ends up saying, well, to feed all these people, it would have cost 200 denarii. Where are we going to get that kind of money? Now, a denarii was a single day's wage. So Philip was basically saying, t- saying that it's going to take a year's wage. Who's got a that we're going to need to feed all these people? Let me ask you all a question. Just tuck this away. This is just, this is not the sermon. We calculate the odds without considering God. How many times do we calculate the odds without considering God? That's what Philip was doing. He's doing the math. He's like, well, it's going to take a year's wage to feed all these people. He's calculating the odds. What's the odds that we could come up with money enough to buy enough bread to feed all these people? But he hadn't put God in the equation. He was calculating the odds without God. And so, as the story turns out, uh, Andrew, another of Jesus' disciples, the brother along, 
he inserts himself into the conversation. So he sees Jesus there with Philip, like, where are we going to get enough bread to feed all these people? Philip's like, I don't know. It's going to cost a year's wage to feed any of these people. Andrew hears it. He inserts himself into the story. And he says, well, he says, we do have five barley loaves and two fish. But in the story there in Acts chapter 6, but he says to them, but I'm not sure that this will go very far. Like, how will this be enough? So again, Andrew is not demonstrating much faith in Jesus either. Both of the A-team. Jesus has picked the A-team and they're both failing. Philip's like, I don't know, it's going to cost a year's wage. And Andrew's like, all I got here are two, you know, fish and five barley loaves. This isn't going to go very far. But again, again, what Philip was doing, what he was calculating the odds without considering God, and what was Andrew doing? He wasn't thinking about how a little in God's hands is a lot. A little in God's hands is much better than a lot in our own. And Jesus gave thanks over the bread and over the fish, and it multiplied. This is a wonderful miracle such that there was enough to feed the crowd. And the Bible says there were 12 basketfuls left over. Why do you suppose 12? One basket for every unbelieving disciple. That's my guess. It's like all these disciples didn't even know what Jesus could do. And so after it was all over, Jesus, I think, was smirking. I'll get back for every single one of y'all. Jesus feeds the five things. That Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, so he departed again to the mountain by himself. There was a timing for Jesus, and it wasn't his timing to be made king. And when he sensed that the people were going to prematurely do this, he slipped away. He went to a mountainside by himself. And chapter 6 tells us that meanwhile, the disciples get into a boat and they sailed to Capernaum on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. In chapter 6, it tells us it's a storm at night. Suddenly arises. His disciples become terrified in the boat. And this is when Jesus comes to them walking on water. Another miracle of his. And in verse 20, he says to them, It is I, do not be afraid. He climbs into the boat. And then it says in verse 21, this is a very interesting verse, Underline it or highlight it in your Bibles in verse 1. It says, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. This is an often overlooked but a miraculous event. As soon as Jesus gets in the boat, the boat was on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Landed in Capernaum. It was just like that. It was transported miraculously and instantly, and suddenly they're there in Capernaum, and that's where they land. Now, that's the backdrop to all of this story because it connects to our opening text. You have to get appreciated in order to really understand why Jesus would say, I'm the bread of life. He's just gotten through feeding thousands of people. They wake up the next morning, and the boats are gone. And the people realize, where is Jesus? And so the next day, all those well-fed people who had just enjoyed a nice fish dinner realized Jesus is gone and they're hungry again. Because it's the next day. They're hungry again. Where's our meal ticket? And so they go looking for They climb in boats. They go over to Capernaum. They, they find him. And this is when they say to him, Rabbi, we've been looking all over for you. Where have you been? And this is where he says in verse 26, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now let that sink in for a moment. He said, you're, you're not seeking me because you want to know me and have relationship with me. You are seeking me because I filled your bellies. And you want me to do something for you again. You're not here for me. You are here because of the benefits you not because of a relationship you want with me. He's saying in effect to them, you are only seeking me because I satisfied your physical hunger. 
but there is a greater hunger of the human heart that can only be met in a relationship with me. That's what Jesus is saying. Uh, just to quote a secular song from the U.S. years ago, Janet Jackson, the sister of Michael Jackson, she had this hit song for a time called, What Have You Done For Me Lately? That's what this crowd is singing. They're like, Jesus, what have you done for us lately? It's been 12 hours since the last meal, and you're not performing for us. What have you done for us lately? Rabbi, they were basically saying to him, have you got any more of that fish and chips? We want a little more fish and chips. Where have you been? And so Jesus says there in verse 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Now, your attention for a moment. In the Bible, the New Testament was originally written in the Greek language. There are two words for the word life in, in our English. Again, I'm just going to read verse 27 again. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Two Greek words for life. One Greek word is bios. We get our English word biology, the study of life. It, it refers to physical life, natural life. That's bios, material life. The other Greek word is zoe. And zoe in the Bible for life means spiritual life, eternal life, uh, fullness of life, vitality of life. Those are two very different words in the Greek language. Bios, physical material life. It's very limited. Zoe, spiritual, eternal, fullness, vitality of life. In other words, when Jesus speaks here, he uses the word zoe. He does not use the word bios. So let me read it again. Do not labor for the food, this is verse 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, because that just fills the need of your bios. He says, but for the food which endures to everlasting zoe, to everlasting eternal fullness vitality of life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. In other words, Jesus is saying here, you have a hunger that transcends physical hunger. All of us do. Every human being has a hunger that transcends physical hunger for food. We have a greater need than physical. It is Zoe, the need that we have for life. And Jesus is basically saying, pursue that. Go after that which can satisfy the deepest longings of the human heart. And that's why then he says here in verse 35... He reveals himself as the bread of life. He is using the word zoe. He is saying, I am the one who can satisfy the deepest longings of your soul. And let me explain to you the problem that we have in the human race. We often have, all of us do, zoe needs. We have need for a connection with God. We have a need for fullness of life. We have a need for eternal life. We have a need for vitality of life, everything that only God can give. But what often happens is we confuse the two lives and we try to meet Zoe needs in bios ways. What I mean by that is because all of us have this deeper love the human soul to connect with God. When you don't connect with God, you end up trying to fulfill those deeper longings in physical, natural, material ways. And when Zoe needs with just physical, material ways, it becomes this vicious cycle of unfulfillment constantly. This is the reason why people engage in different vices and different risky behavior. It's in an effort to try to satisfy the human need for love and acceptance and identity and security and forgiveness. All that can only come from the Lord. But when we don't get those things from the Lord, we end up trying to satisfy soul issues, the Zoe issues that we have 
in very natural and material ways, which often end up very unfulfilling. And when people try to satisfy a Zoe need with a BIOS solution, they plunge deeper and deeper into darkness and despair because it's, there's the lack of true satisfaction. The lack of true satisfaction. You will not find satisfaction in earthly things to satisfy the deeper longing of the human soul. But people go on all kinds of missions. Love, this longing for acceptance, this longing for forgiveness, to be right with God. And and they end up squandering their lives in many ways. It's a vicious cycle. Friends, only God can satisfy the deepest longings of the soul in the areas of love and acceptance and identity and security and forgiveness. And what I'm telling you is that Jesus offers a solution to our need for all of that. It's found in him. Blaise Pascal, the 17th century French philosopher and mathematician and a Christian, he said, quote, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person that only God can fill. And he's right. Now, this is what Jesus is trying to communicate here to the people in this story. But like many of us, they weren't getting it. They kept bringing the conversation back to physical food. Look at your Bibles again in verse 29. And said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. And therefore they said to him, well, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Your attention for a moment. Did he not just feed them like 12 hours ago? never enough. You see, it's never enough for people who aren't really seeking Jesus for who he is. If they're not seeking the face of God, but they're always seeking the hand of God, they're never going to be satisfied. He's calling them to seek him for who he is. They were only seeking him for what he could do for them. They had their hands out, not their hearts open. I hope that doesn't describe you. They had their hands out, but not their hearts open. What will you do for us? Verse 31, they add, our fathers ate the manna in the desert. Talking about Krispy Kreme, I'm sure. (laughs) As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now notice, They're fixed on physical food and physical needs and physical appetites, quoting their father, their forefathers. Yes, of course. Okay, wonderful. God was gracious. He he poured out manna from heaven. But they're bringing Jesus back to that story in verse 32. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. There's the word Zoe again. Gives life to the world. And then he said, then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Zoe, I am the one who can fulfill you. And then he adds, he who comes to me shall never. thirst. These are promises that God makes. Did your mom ever say to you, don't ever use the word never? Like, don't you know, be a person of your word. So don't say never, never, never. Or always, always don't use those, those, you know, extremes. Jesus has no problem using extremes here because he is the one who will satisfy us and we will never hunger and never thirst again. Amen. But he's not talking about physical food. He's not talking about physical appetite. I get hungry in a few hours. What he's talking about here is when you know that you know him, he satisfies everything, always. That's who he is, and that's what he's come to do. One of my favorite stories in the Bible that I think illustrates this is also in John's gospel, and it's from chapter 4, and it's a familiar story. You don't need to turn there. I'll just summarize the events. It's the encounter that Jesus has with the woman at the well. And it's this divine appointment. Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully man. It's this wonderful, divine humanity all in one. But the... 
Sidney would walk a distance, would get tired, would perspire, he would be hungry, he would be thirsty. So in John 4, he sits down by a well in Sychar, and he wants a drink of water. He sends his disciples into town to get food, so he's alone there for this moment. Because again, this is a divine appointment. He has nothing with which to draw the water out of the well. So he's sitting there. It's in the middle of the day, high afternoon, and the Bible says this woman comes to water. Now, normally in that early morning or in the evening in the cool of the day, it was very unusual for her to come in the middle of the season. You see, because she's not accepted by the other women in town because of her past, which will get exposed in this story. So Jesus is there. He has nothing to draw water with. This woman is a Samaritan woman. Jesus is a Jew. There's long-standing hostility between Jews and Samaritans, not on Jesus' part. He loves everybody. assumes that because Jesus is a Jew, he's going to be prejudiced towards her, which he is not. So he says to her, woman, do you have any, can you give me some water? And she looks at him, and I think, you know, it's hard when you read your Bibles to hear attitude or tone or inflection. I think because of just the animosity between Samaritans and Jews, she probably said something like, oh, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, you don't have anything to drink water with, but now because you're in need, you're going to turn to me and you're going to ask if I have a cup or a ladle or something like that. Isn't that convenient? That's the attitude. Talking to you, you'd ask me to give you a drink, right? Now, see, she, again, she's thinking f- physical thirst, quench your soul in ways that you can't even imagine. Her need, so he says to her to bring it out, to bring out her need, he says, why don't you go call your husband? It is a very discerning question to get right to the heart of the matter. He just fillets her wide open. She says, I have husband. He says, you're right. And he looks deep into her soul and knowing all things, he says, the fact of the matter is you've had five husbands and the one you're living with right now is not your husband. You're on man number six. (laughs) And he just read her business. (laughs) And all of a sudden she felt exposed and vulnerable. But you see, Jesus was doing that not to shame her. He was exposing her so that she would see her need to be satisfied by a seventh man she had just met in a way that the previous six could not. You understand? He was saying to her, you have been trying to quench a deep longing of your soul for love, acceptance, approval, security, whatever it might be. And unfortunately, see, she sets the example for us. We have this Zoe need to connect with God, to be fulfilled, to be whole, to be complete. And when we don't get it with God, we start going horizontally instead of vertically. And in her case, she was trying to find it in many relationships with various men. She was still coming up empty. And she finally met someone who could satisfy the deeper Zoe needs of her life to give her a drink in a way that would satisfy her thirst, that she would never be thirsty again. This is what we're talking about here. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he who comes to me shall never hunger, he who believes in me shall never thirst, my question to you, friends, is do you know him that way? Do you know him that way as the one who satisfies the deepest hungers and thirsts of Because I guarantee you, he will give you a satisfaction. He will quench every desire of your heart. The world cannot. You know, uh, American movie actor... Robin Williams took his life a couple years ago. And before he died, Robin Williams said, all it takes is a beautiful smile to hide an injured soul and they will never know how broken you really are. 
Can I tell you that Jesus is the one who makes people whole? Yeah. Jesus is the one who people and brings healing to them and gives them hope and forgiveness and security and identity. He is the bread of life. And if you've never tasted of him, I invite you today, surrender your life to Jesus and he'll make you whole. Would you bow your heads and pray with me?